Okay, so there's still a few people going in there, but I think we'll start away. Um, hopefully they won't miss too much. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate the time uh, you're putting in um, to listen to us talk about PV. This is specifically about PV uh, solar panels. So the we'll give an overview of we just go down through what we'll be covering and um, the basics of solar uh, designing your system, uh, how that's done, the grants that are available, obviously, and the criteria, the grant amounts and kind of some system sizes, uh, inverters, inverters and batteries. Uh, there's some sample photos then at the end and Q&A at the end. So there is a Q&A box um, that you can put any questions you have into. Uh, I will be looking at them here on another screen as we're uh, as we're going. I'll try to answer as many of them as I can as we're as we're doing it. I also have a colleague who's typing responses, so uh, they will answer a few as well. Um, but we'll uh, we'll get started. Just give you a brief overview on Ashgrove and uh, what we do. We've been in operation since two thousand and one specializing in renewable energy since then so heat pumps uh, and solar uh, panels we did our first solar job in 2001 we've been working with SEI since 2006 we're a registered one-stop shop so that allows us to do uh, a whole range of home upgrades it's a, a one-stop shop scheme is something that you probably have heard of not too relevant for um for solar only but um, there is a, a couple of things to be aware of, which we'll go through at the end, just uh, to be aware of before you do solar. Uh, we're a premier Borgash installer uh, for solar systems. We have 18,000 systems in operation throughout the UK and Ireland. Uh, in 23, we did 8,000 installs. So that's design, install, uh, QA, certification, and full handover to the customer. We have a number of webinar series again we would show you more of them at the end which covers a variety of topics this one is specifically obviously uh solar pv and uh, there's another one for home energy upgrades and then there's various uh specific topics that we do throughout the year uh, such as tips and tricks for heat pumps uh stuff on the um loan uh scheme the home energy loan scheme which has come out recently um, so we try to provide webinars, I suppose, to provide as much information as we can to uh, to the public uh, about these topics, because there's an awful lot of moving parts in a lot of it, and it can feel like a bit of a whirlwind. So um, we hope we're not adding to that whirlwind, but uh, helping in demystify a lot of it. Um, we have a YouTube channel with uh, videos. There's a recording of previous webinars up there as well. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, put them into the Q&A box. As I said, I'll try to answer them as we're going. If there's ones at the end, uh, we might address them at the end. But uh, I have a colleague who's typing answers to specific questions as well. So the first thing is the types of solar panels that are out there. So solar photovoltaic are, I suppose, the most common ones out there now. They produce, they produce electricity from the sun. Uh, to produce uh, DC direct current uh, goes into an inverter, converts it to alternating current, and that is wired into your fuse board in your house and powers whatever is consuming electricity at the time that it generates electricity. Um, and you can export the electricity to the grid. There is also solar thermal, which uh, water is heated as it passes through the panel. Um, this is primarily used just for hot water. It can also be used for uh, swimming pools but it just provides the hot water there's no electricity or uh, there's no other benefits from it um the solar thermo thermodynamic again is very rare now but it's refrigerant panels that take heat from the air and from the sunlight and again that's specifically for hot water or for swimming pools um in the rare occasions that we use them photovoltaic or pv is the two is the most common one now uh the cost of them has come down uh an awful lot in the last kind of 10 or 15 years solar thermal would have been popular probably 10 or 15 years ago it would have been 
and the most cost effective one um, but solar pv is by far the most cost effective one uh, that's out there now and it's it's what everybody is putting in um so it, just to cut it off the start solar pv can heat your hot water through a hot water diverter um which connects to your immersion and it powers instead of the electricity coming from the grid for your immersion it comes from the solar panels so the excess electricity when your house isn't using it can go into the hot water so it can also heat hot water um and there's a uh, <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> there's often confusion between the solar pv and the solar thermal in in that people want the one that heats the hot water the solar photo photovoltaic or the pv does heat the hot water but it it does it by providing electricity and then the electricity is run through the electric immersion which heats the hot water so it, from a very high level i won't go into the, the minuscule detail of the electrons uh, on it but basically the sun hit the hits the panels uh electrons then flow to generate electricity um <clears throat> and they it comes out in the form of dc so direct current electricity which is of very little use in your house no use in your house really um all your uh units your fridge your tv all that consume ac alternating current so there's an inverter needed which converts the uh electricity from DC to AC. So this is, I suppose, very much for illustrative purposes, kind of how it would look. So you've the, the solar panels up on the roof. Uh, you can see there's two different sections of them. You can split them up into two different sections. There's a wire that runs from each of the parts into uh, an inverter. You can then have a battery if it's required. Um, uh, but the inverter converts it to AC electricity, which is then wired directly into your fuse board. And your fuse board then distributes that electricity to whatever is being consumed in the house. So you can't really, and there's no real benefit of you telling it just to do the fridge or just to do the TV or whatever it is. What you want to do is make sure that as many kilowatt hours are consumed within the house um, as the solar is being produced so you don't really want to limit it to one specific appliance because when that appliance is satisfied then you don't want to be dumping the extra kilowatt hours so whatever in your house is using kilowatt hours you want as many of the kilo those kilowatt hours to be generated from the solar panels uh but there's also always the backup there that if it needs more it gets in from the grid um and if it uh needs if the house needs less than what the solar panels are producing it can be sold back to the grid or it can be stored in a battery for use later on um batteries whilst they sound like uh, a no-brainer why wouldn't you put them in um they are i suppose the capital cost needs to pay for itself so it's important that if you're putting in a battery you're putting in a system that will charge up the battery and discharge the battery as much as possible in order to make that payback on the battery worthwhile so that's a lot of the science that we we'll get into later on in in uh, how we design these systems i suppose we provide recommendations on the size of systems that can be put in and what we think should happen a lot of people come back and just say yeah i want an extra two panels and i want a battery and that's fine we'll we'll happily install uh, whatever you want but I suppose we we advise try to advise as the implications of it the cost and where it where it best, best fits for your system um so again the the cables here are show being shown running outside of the roof in some cases again routing those is an important factor so often the inverter might be located in the attic so we'll run it from this pa the panels into the attic and connect into the inverter in there. But then we need to find a route from the attic down to the fuse board. So routing of those cables is important. They're, they're not they're not big cables. They're kind of four square or six square cables, um, not massive. So but there still needs to be a route uh, decided for them. Um, the yeah, the, the sizing of the system, I suppose, depends on an, awful, on an awful lot of factors. It's not necessarily the area of your house. Um, we'll get into that in more detail. 
um but it's uh it's more the electricity you consume and how you consume it as opposed to it's uh, the floor area of the house so the first thing that we do uh, or in an ideal scenario a lot of people don't have them but in an ideal scenario we look at 12 12 months of electricity consumption for the house not necessarily the cost people are always think that we're trying to figure out how much they're paying it's the kilowatt hours that you're using is important for us so how many kilowatt hours are you using over the year and how are you using it so the items in red here this is taken from our software is the consumption of this particular house so you can see january it's using more february and march and it comes down in the summer months you'd obviously be using less the, the lights need to be on longer you're hanging washing washing washes out on outside so don't need the tumble dryer all that sort of stuff there's not as much heating if there was a heat pump that was consuming electricity there's not as much heating needed in the summer months so all of that in results in this is kind of the general graph that we'd see for a typical house um so if people don't have electricity bills which i suppose a lot of them don't we can use kind of a number of assumptions we know that the average house uses about four and a half thousand kilowatt hours a year um maybe five thousand so we can see that yeah you're you'll be in around that uh point and there'll be uh the graph would probably look something like that in general so the green uh bars then are the solar production so how much solar is being generated by the solar system this is i suppose a design as opposed to looking back in actual figures which we can do as well but this is the software telling us that in january it will produce uh, a little bit and it'll peak obviously in the summer months so obviously the sun is <clears throat> the days are longer in the summer and the sun is higher so you're getting more electricity in the summer months which isn't ideal because that's when you're consuming the least electricity but there's nothing we can do about the how the sun shines um so that's a that's a constant factor so we all we can do is try to design the system as intelligently as we can that your capital costs don't go through the roof um and that you've got a good a good return on your investment for the pv so that's kind of the annual 12 monthly look at the electricity consumption how you consume it the other important factor of it is how you consume electricity on a day-to-day -day basis so there's I suppose two general ways uh, that electricity is consumed in a house. So there's a single peak profile. So the item, uh, the line in yellow here is how the solar, um, the so sun is shining and how much electricity that the solar panels are generating. The line in blue there is how much is being consumed in the house. Now, obviously, in an ideal scenario, the two of them would exactly overlap unrealistic really because you're not going to change your consumption in your house in order to exactly match the solar peak and during the winter months then you'd have to greatly reduce the amount of electricity you're using so the best we can do again is use science and establish the best design system that'll that'll work for your house so you can see in this single peak profile it's maybe a retired couple living at home or something like that at eight o'clock they're starting using electricity so you have fridges and whatever running kind of in the background here the start of the day they're in the house during the day so they've got a fairly kind of level load during the day and then it kind of peters off at night as they as they go to bed um the other option you have is maybe somebody like me who goes to work in the morning and the house is empty so they have this again constant load of the fridges and the freezers and all that when you get up in the morning there's a peak for cooking the breakfast having a shower or whatever when we're out then during the day it goes back to your kind of base load and then you have your peak in the evening when you come home and cook the dinner and put on the lights and all that sort of stuff so that's a double peak versus a single peak profile so again depends on how you use the house so 
a, a lot of the conversations recently, especially with people, is do you work from home? Because that'll influence whether you're closer to this single peak or whether you're a double peak. Um, obviously, you're at home at the weekends, but you want to size it for or you want to design it for kind of the most probable day. So if you're if you're out of the house between nine o'clock and five o'clock um, on weekdays, but you might be there during the weekend, the weekdays is what you want to go with, because obviously there's five weekdays and there's only two weekends. So you're sizing it for the best, uh, the, the kind of the best average, if you like. Um, so that's an important factor in uh, system size, but particularly with battery choice. Um, whether you should get a battery to store some of that electricity that's being used during the day. So what the battery would do in this double peak profile is this excess electricity that's being generated that you're not using can be stored in a battery or some of it up to the maximum size of the battery. And then you can start to use that in the evening as you as you uh, when you come home. Again, in simplistic terms, it makes absolute sense. But what you want to make sure is that your battery is being fully charged and fully discharged as much as possible. So um, it's not as simple to say as if you if you're not at home during the day, you should get a battery. Certainly should be one of the points that should be considered. But if your system isn't large enough for whatever reason, if you're only putting seven or eight panels up, a battery probably won't charge fully enough in order to justify its cost. So not that I want to talk you out of batteries. Um, we're seldom, we're happy to sell them, but I suppose just that there's not a, a feeling out there that you know, a battery will, will fix all my problems there and I can use it whenever I want. Um, the size of the battery is also limited, um, how much electricity it stores, and we'll go through that again later on. So the orientation of the panels then, once we know what, uh, what your electricity usage is, we're looking at your house to see obviously where the panels can go so the most common pa places uh, panels going on the roof of the house there is options for ground mounted systems but the roof of the house obviously we're limited by what orientation the roof is on that we can get some panels so this is a, a chart that we use again we have the software but this is a kind of a quick chart that we use to, that can uh, illustrate um, the benefits of uh, the south facing system and maybe that the east-west system isn't as detrimental as we think it could be. So you can see there most roofs are, this is the your compass if you like, and this is the angle of your roof. So most roofs are in around 35 degrees. So if you are in a 35 degree pitch roof uh, and it's facing directly south, you can see here kind of 100% of the electricity that's being uh, uh, that could be produced from the panels. That's the optimum angle that it could be, that it could be at. So inside in that red circle, we're at a good. But you can see if it goes to slightly south southwest or south southeast, it's not detrimental. That that couple of degrees east or west doesn't it won't cripple the whole system and and mean that it's completely useless. It only brings it down by a couple of percent, and at the east you can see here so if it's 35 degree pitch at an east you're in between kind of 80 to 85 percent <throat> going into the orange here which would be 85 to 90 so it's um it's not that an east-west system is somehow completely um completely useless to you the east-west system also has an effect in that it uh it alters how uh when the electricity is being produced so obviously with an east-west system you're producing slightly more in the morning midday dips a little bit and more in the evening so it more reflects the um the double peak that we looked at previously I'll just go back to that so your consumption would instead of being one big spike in the uh, at, the, at midday you get two uh spikes in the morning and the evening which again can help um, align you with your consumption if you're out of the house during the day if you're if you have a double peak profile so uh 
East West is by no means uh, a disaster if that's what um, if that's the orientation of your roof. Um, it doesn't affect the amount you produce, and it can also help with the amount that you produce aligning with how you consume electricity. So, uh, yeah, not by not by any stretch of the imagination is an east west system useless. Um, obviously, when you get into north, you're down into kind of 40, 50 percent, um, 55 percent efficiency. So you're getting into a place where maybe it, it, your payback is being stretched out an awful lot. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to take a quick drink. So this is a specific project that um, we looked at, and uh, it was a house actually that Ashgrove did the heat pump in maybe uh, 15 years ago, and <clears throat> they came back and were looking for uh, solar panels to be put on the on the house. So we did this design, which looked at their again their 12 monthly uh, profile, so how their electricity is being consumed. Um, and also looked at their their daily profile, which was um the two of them were were working uh from the house or not sorry outside of the house. Um they were looking for quite a large system. So uh there's I think 18 panels up there. You can see it's put on the garage. So this is software that allows us to to build uh I suppose a 3D model of your house and put where the panels will work. So you can see. The yellow areas are the ideal areas, so that, that that roof is directly south, which would have been ideal for panels. Obviously, purple at the north here, you're getting into worse um, worse production from the panels. You can also see here there's an east-west roof with a chimney here, and that chimney is showing that that area around the chimney gets shading a lot. Uh, so that will fall on specific panels if the panels were put in around that chimney. Uh, around that roof, the uh, shading would fall on one of the panels as the sun is uh, passing through. But it it actually affects the whole all the panels on that string. So all the panels in that group are affected by the shading on one single panel. So what we would do in that scenario is put in optimizers on the panels, which means when as the shadow falls on that specific panels, we say there's six panels in that group. Uh, as the as the uh, shading falls on one of the panels, the other five will operate to the best of their efficiency. Um, and then as it moves to the next panel, the five panels, including the one that, that was shaded, is now working at the, the best efficiency. The, the panels are all connected together, so they will work at the at the lowest. Uh, the lowest panel is dictates the output from that whole group. So um, you want to put in those optimizers in in that scenario. So for a number of reasons, anyway, they decided to put them on the garage. East West orientation suited their consumption. There was also issues with the routing of cables inside in here. They had a, a fuse board out in the garage which we could connect up into there. They had a, a cable that was large enough between the house and the garage to take that PV uh, electricity current that was going between it. So again, if you have no fuse board in the garage, there has to be a, a cable run from the garage into the house to connect into the fuse board so that the electricity can connect into there. They have that cable running from the garage to provide to a fuse board out there. They had whatever lights and sockets and all that sort of stuff out there. But sometimes if you were only ever planning on putting, we'd say, small devices like lights and, and a couple of sockets out there, that cable might not be big enough to take the all the electricity that the solar is producing. So the size of that cable is important. Um, and we, yeah, so just something to be aware of if you're planning on putting them outside of the house. Either there's an existing cable there. Now, the existing cable is obviously providing electricity to the garage before we got there. As we when we put up the panels, it will be supplying uh, electricity into the house. That works fine. The, the current can flow both ways in the cable. So where it's not that a, a specific cable has to be put in for uh, electricity flowing from the garage to the house. All that happens there is that the as the garage is consuming electricity more than the electric the PV panels are generating, 
it uses it in the garage and then the electricity flows the other way then when there's an excess so not important uh not um not detrimental uh that there's, that there's only one cable there it's the size of the cable which is which is important um internet connection is another always comes up in garages the in where the inverter is located it's important well sorry if you want to see the data um it's important that there's an internet connection available there otherwise there needs to be kind of a, a cat six cable run into the house can be done with with uh wireless extenders and all that sort of stuff but just something to be aware of it's not that the system is not working uh it's still producing the electricity but a lot of people obviously like to see it on their app that they can see what um what system uh what they're generating uh on a day-to-day -day basis um but going back to this specific project so you can see here that the total uh, production was uh, 6,590 kilowatt hours or 6.59 megawatt hours. Um, they were consuming about 5,000 kilowatt hours of those, so five megawatt hours, and they were exporting one and a half. So in this case, we actually recommended that they didn't put in a battery. It wouldn't have paid for itself in kind of within, uh, I think it was 12 years or something like that, but they wanted to put one in. Um, and that was no problem. Um, we were happy to put one in. Um, but as long as I suppose we we done our best to make them aware of the science behind it. Um, and again, a lot of people uh, have an emotional attachment to batteries. That's that's no issue. Uh, they they sound very good and they sound like they work. They're not financially viable in all scenarios, but can be very beneficial in other scenarios. There is the side benefit of the batteries where you can charge uh, from nitrate electricity and discharge during the day. So if you're planning on doing that, again, the solar payback only becomes one part of your payback. The batteries then are doing another job for you here where they're consuming electricity at the lower nitrate, storing it up, and then as, the, uh, as you're using it during the day, you're using that electricity that you bought at a cheaper nitrate. So uh, that's a, another side benefit of having batteries and another reason to put, put them in that is not directly related to the electricity the solar panels are generating and storing in the battery. So how long do batteries last? A uh, typical battery is 5.4 kilowatt hours now. Uh, some of them are slightly smaller, 5.1, but the that is the limit for the amount of electricity that that battery can store. Um, so what does that mean, I suppose, in terms of uh, what can you use it for? So this is just a list of, I suppose, typical items. So you can see your electric shower consumes a lot of electricity. So that's 8,000 uh, watts, so 8 kilowatts. So you might see that on your shower. Maybe it's an 8 kilowatt or 9 kilowatt or something like that. But your typical shower is seven minutes. So your typical shower uses 0.93 kilowatt hours, which means you're, you can have about five and a half showers from the electricity that's stored in the battery. Um, so then it goes down to show various other things like the kettle here, it's two and a half kilowatts, an average kettle. You're boiling it for five minutes. Um, we'd say, so that uses 0.42 kilowatt hours. So you can boil the kettle 12 times from the uh, battery in or around. Um, if if all you were doing was boiling the kettle, obviously, if all of these get added together, it limits it. So again, you have down here, then you have your, your LED light, which is down at three watts. So you can leave the light on for 17,000 hours, or you can leave uh, 17 lights on for 100 hours each. My maths worked out correctly there. So that's kind of the electricity that you can store in a battery. It's not limitless. Uh, it does max out at that. Well, you can put more batteries in, so you can put a second battery in, a third battery in, a fourth battery in. But the more you put in, the less return you're getting from them because the less chance they have of getting fully charged and fully discharged. So just a brief um, run through on electric vehicles as well. Um, that we've anything to do with them really, but just um, 
again trying to dispel some of the myths about them so your average electric vehicle consumes about 15 kilowatt hours for every 100 kilowatt kilo, kilometers that it drives um so if your average drive this is from seai these figures your average uh, car drives 15000 kilo, kilometers for the year that's requires 2250 kilowatt hours per annum to power that car um if petrol is five liters per 100 kilometers um at two euro a liter probably a bit high now but that's about 1500 euros per annum whereas your electric car if you're charging to consume 2250 kilowatt hours at day rate or 30 cent per kilowatt hour for electricity it's 675 euro per annum so you can see the cost difference in your uh, your running costs there obviously you pay back then depends on the capital cost of the car alternatively if you if you use night rate to um, charge that car so again if you the lower rate i think it allowed 20 cent or something there per uh, kilowatt hour it'll be down cheaper obviously again to to, to 450 so just the benefits of the electric car over the petrol car in i suppose very uh, very theoretical form so on to the grants which there's a couple of questions about um <clears throat> So eligibility for the grant. So homeowners, including private landlords, can be eligible for the solar grant. So it's a it's a there is a once a one-off grant there that you can get that if you want to put up PV, you can apply to SEI, call the solar installer, get them to install it, they'll give you paperwork, you submit to SEI and get it, get it back. <clears throat> Your home has to be built and occupied before the 31st of December 2020. All that proof of that is based around the MPRN, which is the meter point reference number, which is on the top of your electricity bill. It's an 11 digit number. It starts with maybe 103 or 1100. That uh, MPRN is like the passport number for your house and it's what you, the BER is registered, how they identify that house and any grants that you claim are registered against that, that MPRN. So they won't, don't want to give you the same grant twice for the same property so the grant very much goes towards the property it's not means tested for the homeowner and, and whoever's living in there the property is the is the thing that's getting the grant if you like and you as a homeowner then will get get it at the time so you can only claim it once so if you claimed if you got your pv grant last year you can't get another grant for this year um but uh yeah going back to the to the uh, occupied time when the MPRN was registered with ESB and when it was connected <clears throat> is how they'll know that uh, that it's the it was in 2020 or before. Um, so that's what the SEI used to measure the uh, occupation time of the house. So the grant amounts, they're 800 euro per kilowatt for the first two kilowatts and 250 euro per kilowatt from to uh to four kilowatts so the max grant is 2100 so that's uh 800 plus 800 plus 250 plus 250 comes to your two one if you were getting four kilowatts so that's the max grant you can get <clears throat> if you're putting in smaller systems you get uh whatever that works so if you're putting in a two kilowatt system you're getting 800 i have a couple of examples here so if you're putting in a three kilowatt system which would be approximately seven panels very rough cost there's an awful lot of variables to take into account in the cost but very roughly about six and a half thousand you're getting an 850 euro grant so that's made up of the 800 plus 800 plus one of the 250s because you're you're short of the four kilowatt um so that leaves a, a cost to the homeowner of four thousand six hundred and fifty and again very roughly estimated savings of 650 euro so these are very rough figures just to give you a ballpark of, of what you could expect to pay so that's a payback of 10 years kind of on the smaller systems as the systems get bigger your payback obviously gets less because the first panel uh, for the the start you're paying for all the hardware and all the installation as you put on more panels 
your cost per panel is getting cheaper. So for a six kilowatt system, which would be 14 panels, um, cost is around 8,500 with 2,100 euro of the grant to come off it. So a net cost at home owner of 6,400, estimated savings of 1,200 euro a year. So you're down at whatever that is, five, point five years or something like that. And as you go up to the 18 panels, then rough cost of around 10,000 euro. Um, and the 2,100 comes off that, leaving a uh, cost to you of 7,900 and estimated savings of 600 euro. Again, these numbers are very ballpark, just to give you an idea of the cost access to the roof, uh, extra cable lengths and running, all that needs to be taken into account. But uh, just to give you an idea of what systems in general cost. So the the max one I've put up there is 18 panels, <clears throat> and that's the max for what's called the NC6, so the ESB connection. So hopefully I won't go into too much detail here and bore you too much. But the NC6, the ESB have specific requirements. They don't want everybody to put in, start connecting two megawatt PV systems onto their grid because then they won't be able to control where the electricity is coming from and how much they need on a day-to-day -day basis. So they have to be notified of who's connecting to their grid. So the NC6 is kind of the, the base level of that. You, It's almost a formality. We fill out the form here with the types of panels and the type of inverters, send it off to ESB, they come back and say, yeah, it's approved. We've never had any of them rejected, um, I don't think they ever reject them they just want to know what's happening on it um so the max system that you can put on the, for that nc6 form is 5.5 kilowatts if you're on single phase or 11 kilowatts if you're on three phase so the 16 amps there is is per phase so it's 16 by three um and that's that's the most that they're that DSB are happy for you to put on under this NC6 form, which is basically the formality, the simplest form that you that we can put in. Again, uh, your solar installer will put this in for you, but it's just why why you, the reason why we don't put in a uh, hundred panels on every house. NC7 is the next one up to that, obviously. Um, and that's for larger systems, so up to 17 kilowatts on single phase and 50 kilowatts on three phase. So there's a, a cost of 977 euro to apply for this. And also there's no guarantee that you get it. So you could spend that 977 and get rejected. Um, so your 977 is going straight on to the cost of your uh, electricity install, basically. And um and obviously increases your your payback so um worth knowing that's why uh domestic installs really are limited to the to the kind of the 18 panels and the 5.5 most houses are on single phase um so the inverter size is what that nc6 uh is concerned about not necessarily the panel the amount of panels that you're putting on or the power of the panels so the max inverter size for a house is 5.5 the output of the panels that can be connected to that 5.5 inverter it can be 1.5 times oversized that's a general kind of rule of thumb that that they're they're happy for the inverter to take and it's almost recommended to to slightly oversize it that you're getting the most out of the inverter um so your 5.5 kilowatt inverter can take up to 8.25 kilowatts of panels again we're assuming we're on single phase electricity which we'll assume for for this purpose so on the really summer days there may be some clipping so your panels are are, are rated so that if that 8.25 system was put up on the roof and connected up to 5.5 kilowatt inverter there would be some days where the panels are producing maybe 6.5 it's unlikely that they'll ever i suppose it is possible but that 8.25 is under kind of laboratory conditions so they possibly will rarely produce that 8.25 but there might be days where they produce 6.5 or 7 kilowatts that gets clipped off and the most that's converted to ac is 5.5 so you might think why would you ever 
produce? Why would you ever connect more to it? What it, what the additional panels allow is on the days where it's not very sunny, so which is most of the other days we're dealing with, you're now closer to that 5.5 limit. So you're getting the most out of your, your system. So you can see that here. So if you're if you were to put in the 8.25 panels, which I've shown up uh, there, the inverter size is 5.5. So if you were to, on the not so sunny days, you're still getting up to four kilowatts. Again, this is just for an example purpose. Um, whereas on the really sunny day, you're getting uh, you're getting the 5.5, but you're clipping this this view. But that might only be for maybe 10 days of the years, whereas for the other 355, you're benefiting from this larger spike here. If you are to only put in, we we'll say, six kilowatts of <coughs> panels on the 5.5, obviously, you'd never get into clipping territory, but you're, on your not so sunny days, you're also limiting the amount of electricity that you're consuming. So. It's it's a worthwhile thing to do. It's certainly sorry, certainly not detrimental thing to do to have more panels uh, output connected to your inverter. Um, there's no reason why you wouldn't do at least the oversizing. Again, a lot of the uh, amount of panels that are put on a roof on a roof are dictated by the size of the roof, um, and dormer windows and all that sort of stuff, which is all that for the, the design. But um, if the roof allowed, there's no reason, and you wanted to go for the maximum, 18 would be the maximum, and there's no uh, real downside for it being larger than the inverter that's installed. So how we fit the panels, so this is just a couple of pictures. These panels are older. They've gotten blacker since, since then, but you can see up close what they look like, how they're clipped in. Um, so these are the rails that the panels are are put on first. So first thing that happens is the hooks are put in. These hooks are put in. There's a number of slates taken out. The hooks are then fixed to the battens, and then these rails are put sorry put across the uh, the hooks. Um, the panel is then fixed on to the uh, rails using these clamps. And there's wires. You can see wires here. Uh, that are left there run along the uh, rails and they come into the house. Um, so you can see there that what they look like. So that, that wire will be connected. You can see the, the kind of the end determination there that is plugged into the panels when the panels are put on. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like or kind of a sample of what it can look like inside the house. The layout of this can all change, the branding of the, the uh, inverters and batteries can all change. The one important note to have is the fireman's switch. So that's a switch that uh, has to be put on within 1.5 meters of the cable from the panels entering the house. And the reason for that is that, I suppose, allows electricity to flow when there's electricity in the house. When the electricity from the house goes dead, so for example, if you're the fireman, the first thing he'll do if there's a fire before he starts spraying water, <clears throat> he'll turn off the electricity supply to the house. And what you don't want then is him going in spraying water, think all the electricity is, is off and your panels are producing electricity. And so he then gets a, gets a shock. So in order to prevent that, this fireman safety switch shuts down the power from the panels as soon as the uh, as the power to the house is shut down, so that means also that your panels won't work in a in a uh, blackout. Um, so that fireman safety switch, I suppose we don't like it a lot of us, but it's uh, absolutely critical for safety, and uh, a system can't be installed without it. You can, if you wanted to rewire uh, your house, you can. Just Put a changeover switch that will allow it to run on the uh, on the panels. That's actually not allowed under SEI uh, guidelines, um, but it is possible to do. What we do, and it only occurs in instances where there's a battery. So, with every battery that we install, we we're now putting in a double socket connected directly to the battery. So that allows, if there is a blackout, 
you can plug whatever you want, your kettle or whatever it is, into that double socket, and that'll be powered from the battery. Obviously, the battery can't get recharged, um, but any power that's stored in there before the blackout occurred can be used through that double socket. So it's a, a very, I suppose, effective way of allowing you to, whatever it is, charge your phone or plug in your uh, kettle or, or whatever it is, or an extension need to the fridge, maybe on the rare occasions that you have a a, a blackout. But uh, I suppose it also allows you to be a, a little bit more cautious in what you're using. And um, the last thing you want to be doing is going for a 10 minute shower when the power's gone and use half your battery. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of a, a sample layout. There's more layouts here with two batteries and different types of inverters. There's a number of isolators that need to happen again, <clears throat> there for safety, for safety for maintenance as opposed to for fireman switch. So you can see the fireman switch here. And then you have the DC isolator. So that allows anybody who's coming in servicing any of it or if they need to change something out, they can isolate that electricity here and work away safe that they, they won't get electrocuted. Um, again, just some more pictures. So the uh, difference between a string and a hybrid inverter. So <clears throat> your string inverter is the simplest uh, system. It basically just converts your electricity from DC to AC. Your hybrid inverter has a bit more smarts in that, in that it will connect to a battery. So you can, can't connect a battery to a string inverter. You can connect it to a, a hybrid inverter and the hybrid inverter either says that, yeah, the electricity goes back to the grid, goes to the battery or to the house in reverse order is the priority. So the house is first, then the battery if there's one there and then back to the grid. Uh, you do get paid for electricity going back to the grid. Um, I think roughly, depending on your supplier, it's 24 cents. So that's a kind of signs up. You sign up for that with your electricity supplier. They all have different rates now. Um, but you will still be paying less uh, or get paid less than what you're paying for it go coming in. So if you're paying 30 cents for it coming in, you might only be getting paid 20 cents for it going out. So it's still in your benefit to use it on site as much as you can. Um, rather than paying the extra 10 cent for it coming back in later. Um, so that's where a, a battery can be useful, um, but the battery is only saving you the 10 cent, the difference in what you're, what you're uh, paying for it going back out um, versus what you're paying for it coming in. So it's not saving you the 30 cent that you're consuming on the electricity because you're getting 20 cent anyway for it. Um, so just another thing to bear in mind for batteries, it sounds like I'm very negative on batteries, but um, no, they absolutely do make sense. I'm actually quite a fan of them, but just uh, there's a, can be a feeling out there that they solve all the problems. Um, obviously you can get different size inverters. So if it, it was a very small system, you can get a, a three kilowatt inverter, just slightly cheaper than the, the 5.5 kilowatt or six kilowatt inverter. Um, Anything else on inverters, your battery, yeah, your string inverter doesn't uh, display as much information as well. So your string inverter doesn't have, um, doesn't have, it can be connected up, but it doesn't come as standard for you to see what your incoming electricity consumption is. So it only measures what electricity is being uh, produced from the PV, whereas your hybrid inverter can be connected to your uh, a meter can be connected to your incoming supply, it's called the CT clamp, and that will measure how much electricity is coming into your house, how much electricity is being uh, produced by the, the PV and the difference between them. So um, there's more information as standard on the hybrid inverter than on the string. We do have uh, people as well who put in the hybrid inverter now and uh, look at the data over the course of kind of 12 months and decide then if a battery is needed or is worthwhile. Another uh, thing to that is uh, very useful for a hybrid inverter. So that if you do decide that you need a battery, you don't have to rip out the string inverter that you've already paid for and put in a, a hybrid inverter um, instead of it. One cautionary tale with that uh, technology, I suppose, is advancing quite quickly. And we want to uh, make sure that the inverter will still be compatible with the battery that's out. So if you're 
considering doing it maybe over a 12 month period that you're going to be looking at your data that's fine but i suppose just be cautious if you're looking 10 years down the line technology may be different and that the batteries that are out then might not be compatible with the hybrid they might be as well but just to just to bear it in mind when you're making that decision um what we advise people to do is if they are going down that route of putting in a hybrid inverter and seeing if they're putting in a battery in the future look at it over 12 months and then kind of make the decision then because um we we should be able to to have the same compatible battery in that in that space of time um again this is uh some more pictures of panels installed this is the clothesline as opposed to electricity cables just for reference they weren't run across the uh across the head like that this is a <laughs> excuse me i'm just taking another drink this is a ground mounted system um which is an alternative to mounting it on your roof obviously you can pick your orientation to be directly south there is a concrete pad required below it and a frame we're to frame and then the uh, panels are fixed to that frame and obviously then there's a cable route required from the panels to wherever the inverter is and again from the inverter to wherever the fuse board is so um yeah it can be very useful in certain scenarios this is another ground mounted system which uses screws those screws can be put into uh, the ground relatively level ground is kind of required there is different lengths of screws um but ideally it'd be it'd be somewhat level um but your frame then is fixed to the tops of those screws um just to discuss i suppose where solar maybe isn't the first protocol or shouldn't be the first protocol I'm conscious now i've been rambling on for 55 minutes now so um i'll try to keep it brief um i think i am answering most of the questions or most of them are being answered as uh through uh direct responses but um if there is any more that you come in get them in uh and we we'll go through them um these are scenarios where I suppose PV wasn't the first option and it's just because it ruled them out of potentially getting other grants in the future <clears throat> purely because the the bar or the BER rating of the house went up so these are people who rang into us looking for solar panels we were quite familiar with the houses uh, in the estate there were semi-detached houses in the estate we'd done a number of them previously um, they rang in looking for uh, panels um, it was a 103 meter squared house semi-detached house two story and the existing BER was a C2 um, we the panels were costing uh, about 7,000 in this case but we knew that we could get the what's called the one-stop shop compliance um, so it's 100 kilowatt hours better off on your BER the BER must get to a B2 and put in a heat pump the heat loss of the house must be below two so we knew we could achieve those those three uh criteria with these houses by doing attic and cavity wall insulation an air to water heat pump pv panels <clears throat> and the total cost to them was eight thousand one hundred and sixty. so that was where the panels would have cost them seven thousand they could get all this work done for eight thousand one hundred now and it has happened before where people have got PV installed from another company and then rang us to look at getting the upgrade grants but because they installed the PV and you have to get a, a BR rating done after you install the PV in order to claim the grant that brings the house up too high in order to meet these eligibility criteria up here so it ruled them out of getting those bonus grants that are available by grouping all these works together so you can see in this scenario the work cost of the works was 25,000 and there were 17,000 euro worth of grants available so if they went through the individual measures which they could have done and they could have got uh, grants for attic and cavity they could have got grants for uh, air to water heat pump and they could have got the the solar panel grant which we discussed about but they would have only got <clears throat> 11,400 euro worth of grants so they would have left 5,600 euro behind them and their bonus grants that SEI are giving to people who are doing these kind of 
we'll call it significant upgrades, even though in this case, they are all quite shallow measures. Your attic and your cavity are done in a day. It's rolling out attic insulation uh, in, the, uh, in the attic and pumping the cavity walls again, which can all be done in a day. Your air to water heat pump is kind of maybe two day of an install. And the solar panels, the roof uh, fitting is uh, maybe a day and the electrical is another day. So they're they're quite shallow measures. They're not. It's not incredibly disruptive. Um, but by grouping them all together, uh, they gained an extra five thousand six hundred euro in grants, and they still got their their PV panels installed. So, um, just something to be aware of if you are looking at PV um, installation. That if you are thinking I'll do the PV now, and then maybe I look at the heat pump or I look at doing something else next year the year after might not be the best port of call because of that increase in the in the bar rating you get from the pv panels um but uh, just to be aware of so these guys also also qualified for the green mortgage by getting the ber up to a b3 so this is another similar house um the only difference in this one was we did the windows and doors as well and they got an ev charger too the cost for that was 15,100 so you can see the BEH grants the, if they were to do the individual because there's no grants in the individual measures for doing windows and doors you can only get that through the multiple measured grants and um, they would have left 11,400 euro in grants behind them so um, <clears throat> worth being aware of again uh, completely not a, <laughs> sounds like I'm being very negative on this uh, on this webinar but we don't want to talk you out of PV I suppose it's just to make you aware of all the options that are out there before you do it, um, just so that you're informed as best as possible. Um, so we do have uh, a number of other seminars. This one's out of date now, unfortunately, but um, there is a, a link on our website. <clears throat> if you go onto our website, you can uh, you can look at the list of uh, webinars and seminars that are coming up. <clears throat> there is specific ones on home energy upgrades and retrofits, which the last few sections we we go into in more detail there about the one stop shop and the uh, community energy grants. And the solar one, obviously, this one happening every every Wednesday. Um, but if there is any other questions that you have or anything specific you'd like us to cover, we do uh, specific seminars on do's and don'ts of heat pumps on uh loan schemes that are out there the uh home energy upgrade loan scheme is has been released by sci as well unfortunately uh, solar pv on its own is not eligible for that uh low cost loan but uh the one-stop shop and the home upgrades are are uh, available or are eligible for that low cost loan um but we do a number of those um uh, you can find that on our website. And if there's any suggestions uh, on stuff you'd like us to cover, we're happy to, to put together um, webinars on it and uh, try to assist in demystifying a lot of the information that's out there. So just briefly, there's commercial grants available for, uh, I suppose, businesses who are looking at putting in larger systems. So the still the ESB, uh, rates apply, I suppose, the NC6 and the NC7, but there is different grants from SCAI, which allow you to put in bigger systems. So you can see this is the uh, grant structure on the right. So it's uh, 900 euro per kilowatt up to two, and then it's another 300 euro per kilowatt for three and four, and 300 euro for any kilowatts between seven and 20. So you can see here the, oh, sorry the size of the system. So a 30 kilowatt system, you get 8,600 euro of grants. If you're putting in a 300 kilowatt system, you're getting 57,600 euro of grants. So again, these are very big systems, but worth knowing that there's grants avail available for uh, for commercial side as well. This is kind of what a commercial install looks like. This is, I think, 50 or 60 kilowatt system. Um, so on the larger side, um, and you can see it's very similar in that the rails are are put up and the panels are connected to the rails. Um, that's it, I think, for me. Um, I can't see any. I think I've addressed all the questions. Um, if you do have anything, please 
get in contact with us and we'll uh, we can get one of the team to reach out and I suppose advise you as best we can. Um, but thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it and uh, all the best. Thanks.